a young man old enough to have school-aged children was talking to his older and hopefully far wiser uncle at a family gathering. The young man's children had been running about creating havoc from the moment they arrived. And having had enough, he now had the three of them each sitting in a separate corner for some much needed time out, as much for himself as for the boys. Turning to his uncle, he made the comment that he wished, ever since he had become a father, that his children had come with an instruction booklet, <laughs> because he definitely felt he was in far over his head when it came to parenting. At which point, the uncle reached over to the table beside his chair and handed the young man the Bible. Isn't it strange, as I lose my microphone, isn't it strange that so many people, especially in today's modern world, fail to understand that this book, the Holy Bible, God's words of wisdom and instruction and guidance, was written not only for the benefit of people long ago, in New and Old Testament times, but was designed to be as relevant in today's world as when it was first written. Listen to that again. It was designed to be as relevant in today's world as it was when it was first written. Now, I know you can't say that about most books. For instance, I would not want a doctor operating on me who had been trained with the medical teachings from the time of Hippocrates where he started out by talking about bloodletting and the benefit of using leeches. Though I understand they're making a comeback in some interesting situations. Nor would I want to take on a journey of discovery to find new and unexplored areas in our world using an atlas that pointed out that the earth was flat and that it explained that sea monsters existed at the edge of the earth and were going to devour you if you sailed too far out. So yes, I agree that most of literature written hundreds, perhaps even thousands of years ago, can be considered out of date. But that's not the case with the Bible. In fact, if the basic guidelines and precepts and instruction, instructions, instructions written therein were or are followed, one will find most every answer that they need for living in and making the most of today's world, including how to be a parent, or as this is Father's Day, how to be a father, or as we've talked about, a fathering figure in the life of a child and the children around you. Take, for instance, these words found in the 13th chapter of the book of Proverbs. In verse 24, it says, A good father disciplines his children. Now, as always, I wish there was more explanation than just that simple phrase. It might, though it doesn't, continue to say that one does not let children run wild, as the expression goes, like a band of wild Indians. And it does not go on to say, but it could, that they should, let's see, how do I put this? That children should not be allowed to do anything they wish. Look at the child's hiding already. That they should not be allowed to do anything just to keep them happy and content and not throwing a tantrum. In other words, you don't buy off your children. Parents who buy whatever is asked, whatever is requested, give in to whatever they are prodded to do, end up with spoiled and demanding children who feel they have the right to receive anything they ask for as adults. That's not what the Bible is trying to say. It does not say those things, but somehow I think God would be in line with them. That it is important to discipline a child. Now, just how far this discipline goes, I have to admit, is sometimes difficult to decide on and determine. 
I, I think most of us, perhaps from personal experience, and I can't wait to see the hands, are familiar with the expression, spare the rod and spoil the child. And how many of you were ever told, let's be honest, to go get a switch? Anybody here? Yes, I mean, it was something, wasn't it? I suppose that's why authors such as Julia Martin wrote books entitled How to Bend the Will Without Breaking the Spirit, or James Dawson How to Shape the Will Without Breaking the Spirit, to try to give us guidance on how much there should be done without overdoing it. Somewhere in between is a balance learned through time and by experience that will allow a child to be raised respecting their adults, following their rules, and doing so somewhat voluntarily and not because they're forced. I do not know if there is anything that is more important than the proper upbringing of children. I get that from scriptures like the passage found in Proverbs 22, 6, where it says that we are to raise up children in the ways of the Lord, and when he is old, he will not turn away from it. Listen to that phrase again. Raise up a child in the ways of the Lord, and when he is old, he will not turn away from it. I know that one is true from personal experience, and I would like to testify to that to witness. As a young child, our family was always in church. We went to Sunday worship. We went to Sunday school classes. I had a suit and a shirt and a tie. It even had cufflinks and shoes. We were dressed to the nines when we went to church. We went to all church events. We went to fellowship times. We went to sing-alongs. I went to vacation Bible school. Here is the key phrase. My grandparents saw that the seeds of faith were planted within my heart, nurtured and cared for. I see Chris going back because we know that's her story here. My grandparents saw that the seeds of faith were planted within my heart, nurtured and cared for, so that someday they would sprout, they would grow to maturity, they would bear good fruit, like Jesus talks about of the vine in the New Testament. And I am so glad they did. I'm indebted that they did, because at age 10, my life entered my dysfunctional phase. You've heard me talk about it. My mom married a man who was an alcoholic. And for five years, we never went to church, except for two weddings. Suzanne and Andrea got married, so we went then. There was no church during this time, no Bible reading. I don't think there was a Bible in the house. No Christmas pageants, no summer camps. We did not talk Jesus at any point. But at age 15, she divorced him. We moved back to where my grandmother lived. And soon thereafter, I met a friend who was part of the youth group of First Christian Church North Hollywood. You've heard this story, maybe some of the new people haven't. He told me they played volleyball on Sunday night. I liked volleyball. First, we had to go to a Bible study with old Reverend Todd, and I mean the man was older than dirt. But we went to Bible study, we played volleyball, we went to pizza, and I started back in the church. And you know what happened? Those spiritual seeds that my grandparents had planted began to come out of their dormant stage. They were planted in my heart and they began to sprout and bear fruit. I reaffirmed my faith at age 16. I began to be involved in the church in every possible way. I brought my mother, my sister, and my grandmother. Our entire family soon became a major part of that congregation. And four years later, I made the decision at age 19 to enter the Christian ministry. All because of seeds that had been planted from dormant, and then came the fruit. The young man mentioned at the beginning of the story, if he had read the Bible from his youth, perhaps would have been aware of passages like Ephesians 6 verse 4, which admits that children can be a handful. Can I get an amen to that? Children can be a handful. They can push you to the limits, test you to the max, give off every nerve that you have, 
But when you continually pour love into them, no matter what they do, when you set your guidelines and let them know it is because you love them so much that you are doing so, which is by the definition of tough love, when this is done many times, and I wish I could say most, I wish I could say all, but I can't, many times they will respond. Ephesians 6, 4 says, Fathers, do not exasperate your children. Instead, bring them up in the training and instruction of the Lord. In other words, you let them know that no matter how many times they push you away, how many times they go away, how many times they reject what you believe in, you will always be there waiting for them when they return. Isn't that what the story of the prodigal son is all about? Could a son have treated a father any worse than the prodigal treated his father? He embarrassed him. The man could barely show his face in town among his friends, his family members, his co-workers. The son tore his heart out, stomped upon it, cast away everything the father had done to provide for him, and squandered it on reckless and wild living. There is no doubt that the father would have been justified in turning his back on him when he dragged himself home. But what would that have gotten him? He still would have been separated from the child of his loins. A part of his heart would still be missing. The ache and pain would still be there. And so he welcomes him back. Now notice this part here. The son did come back. <coughs> notice the planting of seeds. Even in his wildest times, he knew his father would not turn his back on him. He knew that his father would be there. Even if it turned out that he was going to have to be treated like one of the field workers, one of the slaves are there, his father would take care of him. That knowledge had been planted in his heart, and so he returned to the one that he knew loved him. I have read somewhere, I do not remember where, that the role of a father, a mother, a parenting figure, and we always include all of those, right? Because so many of us were not raised in the my three son sort of home. We are told to be our child's first teacher. Not the school, not the government, not life in general, but we must be their first teacher. It is said that a child's pattern of behavior is largely set into him or her between the ages of three and five. And if you did not get it done then, you're going to have to play catch up. It's going to be a little bit on the harder side if you've got that 18, 20, 25 year old at home, you're still working. But it's still possible. It just takes a bit more effort. The wise old uncle told his young nephew that the Bible contains story after story of fathers interacting with their children, and that if he were to read them even now, they would give him the knowledge and the wisdom he needed to raise those children correctly. For instance, the story of Noah, who perhaps was the most exemplary of all fathers, at least in the eyes of God, and that's a great recommendation. He was nearly perfect in every way, sort of like Mary Collins, but long right hair and beard and he smelled of animals. But, so nearly perfect Noah in Genesis 6 verses 9 to 10 is described as a righteous man, virtuous, upstanding, decent, principled, sort of like me. And it's said that he walked with God, which is the highest form of praise. He followed his instructions, he listened to his commandments, he lived the kind of life that God intended for all humankind, and he raised his boys to be exactly like him. His goodness was so great and the example he set so clear that only he and his three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth, and their wives were saved from the flood. Because they had been raised correctly, the seeds had been planted, and when they grew to be young men, they walked in the way of the Lord as well. There are so many great stories about fathers and all kinds of fathers. Stories like Joseph, the earthly father of Jesus, who though he risked public humiliation for taking as his wife a young woman pregnant with another child, he raised that child as his own 
became the first stepfather written about in the Bible. He did this when he could have turned away, but instead he provided for his family. He taught his son a trade. He saw he was biblically taught. He saw that he was in attendance at the great temple at every significant point in his life. All of this as an example of what a father does, whether the child is biologically yours or not. When a child is placed in your responsibility, Joseph is the example to follow. The more stories I read in connection to researching this, the more I saw that the Bible was the perfect parenting guide, especially when it comes to one of my favorite fathers, God the Father. Do you know why I really like him the best? It's because he told his son how he felt about him. How many of you ever wished at some point in your life that your father figure would have told you how much they loved you, how much they cared for you, that they would have embraced you, that you could feel that? So many of us yearn for that and never got it. But what does God do when Jesus is baptized? The voice of God comes. This is my beloved Son, with whom I am well pleased. Wow, Dad's proud of me. Dad thinks I'm something special. Dad says I've done something good. Do you realize how many of us have needed to hear that all our lives? He goes on in another passage to say, This is my beloved Son. Listen to him. I trust him, I believe in him, I have put my faith in him, I know he will do well. I wanted to hear that over and over. Time and time again, those are the words that we wanted to hear. God the Father sets the example. This is what you do with your kids. So as we go through our Father's Day Sunday today, Whatever role of father you have, a father, a stepfather, adopted father, grandfather, uncle, mother, grandmother, whoever it was that fathered you, let us hope that they follow the good book and that we ourselves look for the opportunities where we may continue to do the same. This is a parenting manual that I wish, hope, and pray that everyone who fills one of those roles will read, internalize, and put into use. The Holy Bible, the great parenting man. Shall we bow for a moment of prayer? Dear Lord, I thank you for what you have done with this book to show me how to be the kind of father that I needed to be. Lord, I pray that in everyone's life, no matter what their age, that there will be a mentor, a fathering figure, someone who can care for them in the ways that you have explained here in this book. Let us be the best fathers and fathering figures we can, so we can raise up the children in the ways of the Lord.